So we will have everything recorded. All right, so here is the, oh my goodness, how'd that happen? Okay, here's the syllabus. Um, uh, there's, oh wait, let me stop the share for a minute. Um, can you guys turn on your uh, video cameras? <clears throat> I have mine on in just a second. Sorry, I'm like eating. Okay, so Ivy, really, I mean, your face is, is no bigger than mine. <laughs> no, I'm eating right now. And <laughs> oh, well, you know, I don't even mind because we're having it over lunchtime. Um, okay. So I don't mind. I even go to conferences. And I leave my video on when I'm eating. And I don't know if that annoys people, but I find it more annoying just to stare at white letters, you know? These aren't people. <laughs> eating is natural. I don't mind that. Anyway, I what I my main message to you, and this is really important, is that um, COVID, unlike everybody else in the world, probably. COVID has been really good to me. Everything about COVID has made my life better. And um, because I naturally spend time in my office thinking, and I always felt obliged to go do all sorts of other stuff. And all of a sudden I wasn't obliged to do that. And then I was allowed to move close to my grandparents, and, uh, grandkids and teach online. So. The point is that I'm not stressed out. My children are and my students are. So what I want you to think about this class, I don't want you to think this class of this class as a stressor, right? I want you to think of it as an opportunity for you to say your say, to learn about your own mind, like what's going on in your mind? What do I think? So you develop that reflective capacity and that is what'll give you strength, right? You, especially COVID should make it clear that you've had to step back and think about stuff in order to avoid going totally nuts. <laughs> Does that make sense? You had to rethink so much. Well, that's an opportunity for the philosophy teacher to tell you, this is what you should learn how to do the rest of your life, is step back, rethink, recalibrate, and decide how you're gonna respond, because that's what you've had to do, right? You've all had to decide how you're going to um, deal with COVID. And I, I hope you read that paper from that girl from Syria. Did you read that? letter to herself well it was posted you're supposed to read it um anyway you'll have to read it after class but if you if you're feeling sorry for yourself you can always uh my god right she lives in syria she was stuck in bangladesh um you know one day she told me Oh, I hope you're forgiving. I'm, I couldn't make it to class this week. And I hope you'll consider that in the grade because somebody dropped a bomb in my neighborhood. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna grade you down for that. So um, I don't know. I mean, personally, when I was going through a lot of stuff in life, I always stepped back and I said, what if I were not white? What if I were poor? What if I weren't from the US at this time in history? And I just got some perspective on it. I really did. And it helped me cope with the things that I faced because I felt like compared to every other human being in the world or every human being that's lived in the past, I have a privileged life. And so I started imagining what other people have had to cope with. And it, it just helped me a lot to cope. I just started identifying with humanity rather than getting stuck in my own issues. 
So that's what I think humanities classes are supposed to do is sort of expand your concept and learn how to empathize with other human beings, how to sympathize. Empathize is when, yeah, I've had that exact same thing. Sympathize is when, no, I haven't had that, but I can understand how somebody could be in that situation or could feel that or do that. So I'm ho so I do want you to try not to think of this class as one more stressor, right? One more list of stuff to do. I want you to think of it as your space to get to know yourself and hopefully to strengthen your character, but especially the teacher, right? I, I want to come across as somebody who listens, somebody, if you really have an obstacle, will um, adjust. Um, I have time to adjust. And again, I, I think I need to be a calming influence in the middle of the storm, right? The eye of the storm. Somebody has to be. And it should be somebody older like me. I have tenure. I mean, there's so many ways. I'm so much uh, less stressed out than my children and my students and my grandchildren. So somebody's got to sort of be there. And that's what I hope you see me that way. And when you're picturing in your mind this class, um, that you'll, you won't think of it as a stressor. OK, go ahead, uh, Warren. Um, as you were talking about stuff like that, um, it led me to remember one of the things that I read that I was going to say, one of the articles that we were supposed to talk about. Um, it's the, the one about Donna Zuckerberg. Oh, yeah. Uh, the review. There was a part in it, and it was the part that I was going to say that stood out to me, was that um, they were urging philosophers to kind of speak up because they have a certain understanding. And with you saying all the things that you're saying, saying that you have a certain amount of experience and you understand this, and this class should be your space, I'm technically saying that um, philosophers know how to articulate themselves and articulate words and they are urging them to speak up. But she's also saying that they are speaking up but they're at a risk of like being threatened like how Zuckerberg was. She was threatened and all that type of stuff. And it just came to me that you're a philosopher because you're teaching philosophy here in the humanities. And it's just so funny to me that I read that and it stood out to me. And then today you're here giving us all these guiding, these guiding lines to say, you should not stress out. You should not see this class as a stressor. We should relax. And it's just proving the point that they're saying philosophers should speak up because if they do, maybe a lot of people will look into what they're saying and apply to their lives and lives will be a lot easier because philosophers, they have a certain title, I would say, I would say because people would tend to listen to doctors and lawyers as opposed to their regular peers, but you're a qualified individual. And that's why that really stood out to me because you do have the knowledge. You telling us that, okay, COVID was not a stressor for you. A lot of people would probably be like, oh, she's crazy, but there's a deeper way and a different way to look into things. So yes, I just, I just wanted to get that out before I lost the thought because it's actually one of the things that stood out in the readings for me. Good, that, again, yeah. because we have a small class, yes. feel free, this is just a conversation. I, I don't like listening to myself talk for long periods of time. Yeah. Um, and I do learn from my students. Um, I, and that's why I'm including their letters in my um, materials for you to read because they have more to say than I do, especially since they're younger and they're preparing to go into a world that is going to be disrupted from now on. So you're going to have to cope with a, an in unstable world. And so you, it's a good time for you now to decide, 
I've got to practice this because it's not going to go away. Somebody has to lead. Um, and I do want my students to see themselves as leaders. And I apologize because my generation has handed you a pile of garbage and we could have done better. We could have faced climate change and we didn't. We could have dealt with racism and we didn't. We could have avoided allowing our country to get taken over by billionaires who sent us to war and made a profit off of it, but we didn't. And so now you have to deal with it. Um, and I apologize, but at least the one thing I can do is to teach classes that at least give you some tools. Um, the other thing about that reading though, <laughs> Warren, I got to catch you on this. Um, this is one of the themes of the class is that when, when we go through Aristotle's virtues and we go through Seneca and we go through that letter and those materials, I hope I convince you that these virtues are real and they're important and you think about them and they're based on the human condition. But then that letter is about how each of these theories can get corrupted. Right? And so that Reddit letter was about using Seneca to justify horrible misogyny, right? Basically, that one guy, he was describing things he said, and Zuckerberg says, this qualifies as sexual assault, right? <laughs> and also, it says, you know, when a woman resists, it's because she really just wants to be raped. She, they, she likes sexual aggression. There was all this really horrible stuff. And so and I also, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Warren. Go ahead. No, honestly, I also wrote a small bit about that because I did like, I typed up what I was, what I was supposed to say. And the first starting bit I was saying, until this very day, I just don't understand why men, I'm a man, I, uh, we as men like to input on problems that are concerning women. Like it's really just not our place. Like not because a woman says everything, not everything a woman says we have to um, involve ourselves in. And we can even see today in the government, I'm not gonna talk about politics because I really don't like politics. They are men making rules for the women that are only going to affect the women, which really it disturbs me because it's not going to affect any of us as men. It's about the woman. The woman understands her body. She knows what she wants to do and she knows what will affect her. And then we have these men back then, all the way until now, to be or trying to play a superior role in making the decisions for women. And to me, that's really annoying because well, we should it's, not. Right, it's not just men, it's rich, privileged, Western white men, right? It's white men, it's rich men, it's powerful men, it's wealthy men. And um, I do think that you need to pay attention uh, at who is making an effort to be more inclusive and have more women, and my, more minorities and more people who pull themselves up because there is a big difference between, uh, that's why I don't think you should ignore politics. There, there are people who gain votes from- No, I don't ignore it, I just, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not the type of person to sit and have a 10 minute or 15 minute conversation with someone about their political views. And I know because it's been yeah. polarized. It's polarized. So I don't, I don't want to go there either. I just yeah. want you to look at which, which politicians gain votes from bring, being privileged, rich, Western white men and which politicians gain votes from trying to be more inclusive, right? Because that takes political courage. Like 
or you're going to take a risk. You're going to lose votes because you're going to run women, less privileged minorities, right? So think about that, you know, who has some political courage to stand up and even lose votes and who doesn't? Or who gets rewarded for trying to be inclusive? That's, those are questions. And, and I do, I, I think the polarization is terrible. That's why you have to start asking questions underneath the polarization, does that make sense? I mean, if you do care about more inclusion, then you have to step back and figure out, you know, which one is, you know, working on this more than the other one or the other whatever. Anyway, so it's good, Warren. I, I think that was a good comment. So um, Ivy, do you have any comments? We can go right to those readings. Just gonna, um, what he was saying made me uh, realize that women, I don't know if this is something you guys have noticed, but women are more prone to disease than men. But I, in my experience, I have noticed that women that I meet or see online or whatever, they're very, I don't want to say ignorant, but unaware of a lot of the um, benefits or the things that you're supposed to do as a woman. They're not acknowledged on it. And if you go to stores, the products for women, um, they're not healthy for you at all. Like uh, boric acid, that's what they use in like mouse traps and rat poison and stuff like that. But it's in literally all of the suppositories and stuff for women. And that's bad for you. And I find that like, so like who decided that this is what we should put in our bodies and they live, you know, like they survive. It had to have been someone that wasn't a female to my knowledge because females have severe responses to these, you know? And it's like, maybe if we had more women or yeah, more people acknowledging us and showing us this is what we're actually supposed to be doing, then maybe we wouldn't be as down or as prone to disease as we are. Because like everything can kill us from having a baby or not, you know? I just find that so crazy. Actually, I do teach a whole class on women's issues. So I'll put in a little plug for my class. Um, and women's products are overpriced and women's pants don't have pockets so that they have to buy purses. And I mean, the list goes on and on. But when I was teaching, and the, here's, the, here's the punchline of this conversation. One thing you need to learn in college if you don't learn anything else is that you need to find the data before you have an opinion, step back. Mm -hmm and go do some research, right? You understand that social meeting is killing us. Yes. In our ability, right. But that is what philosophy is, that reflective capacity. And, and that is what social media is killing. Um, because social media, people have data and they have facts, but they draw the wrong inference. They don't step back and see the bigger picture. Does that make sense to you all? Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, I'm not, you can go there with, you know, telling lies or alternative facts, but let's just say everybody has facts. Then you gotta step back. Okay, let's contextualize, let's look at the history, let's look at the, you know, context, let's look at the world as a whole. And if you get in that habit of doing that, you'll find places to go where people will have educated opinions or I mean it is difficult I know um, the thing I go to I go because the person interviews people that are our um, authorities on the issue of the day and I usually pay I pay attention to the authority because the person running the show has biases that really annoy me. <laughs> And so you just have to sort of 
practice, right? And I think in college, so I do have a reading group. This one girl said, how come nobody talks about these issues like at lunch or you know informally? And so I started a reading group. I read, that's another thing I did during COVID. I read about, I don't know, 30 books about all this stuff that's been going on that I never had time to read. And then I scanned about 40 pages and I wrote some basic outlines. And so if you want to get on that Google Classroom, you just haven't, you know, I can, I'll let you know what each book is about. And it's getting you in, in practice for what is the context within which I'm stepping in. And then Dr. Beck has chosen these books for her reasons. Those are her reasons. Um, so Aristotle says the art of statecraft is the art of weaving together the rich and poor and having a strong and stable middle class. And he says, if you don't have that, you have instability and you're gonna get authoritarianism. Doesn't matter if what your constitution says, if you have a strong, stable and middle class, you'll be okay. It'll be, you, people will be able to flourish. But if you don't, you're going to have instability and someone's going to take over and say, you know, I'm going to fix it. And then all they do is give the power to their buddies. They don't fix anything. So Aristotle said that that's kind of the guiding light behind the books that I read what's happening in the economic system, what's happening in the political system, what's happening that's shrinking the middle class and what recommendations are there for bringing us, bringing people into the middle class, right? So um, anyway, the main point is learning how to step back, think the bigger picture, figure out who's worth listening to. Um, and one last plug for my women's issues thing. I was teaching it jointly with Lion students and these women from Southeast Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. I mean, all these places. And boy, they have stories to tell. Oh my God, you can imagine, right? There's women who got circumcised. They're from Yemen. I have students who got circumcised. I have a student who was That's married. Me. <laughs> yeah, but you get to talk to them, right? You get to be online and listen to their story. This one girl got married to a guy who poured acid in her eyes and temporary blinded her three different times. And she got divorced and now she's in college. Like, bravo, you know? Wow. And, yeah. <laughs> And then there are these girls from Syria and all this stuff. But, but the one thing I wanted to point out about the borax and the tampons, right? All of them talk about this hugely popular product that costs a lot of money, but women will save all their money. It's stuff that bleaches your skin so it's whiter. Like they're obsessed about having lighter skin and they'll put this stuff on them, right? They'll pay all this money and it's poisonous and all this crap because it's just an obsession. And then, I, um, isn't that awful? I, mean, I um, had a friend that's a foreign exchange student. She was telling me about how she went to um, Asia and they had this procedure where they, it's plastic surgery is like, a thing that it's a trend you know and like they um kept asking her are you gonna make your skin lighter you know they kept asking her stuff like that and she just found it so weird because they it's a normal procedure that they get done and I just feel like normalizing that is so crazy because why would you oh my god I can't <laughs> yeah these countries are are number three, Bangladesh is number three in the world for climate impacts. Like the whole country is going to go down the tube in a flood and they're bleaching their skin, you know? You could be <laughs> doing your researches otherwhere, you know, resources, other places. So I, 
I just, sometimes it's easier to see it when you're looking at somebody else, mm -hmm. right? You can see, my God, those people have totally been brainwashed by capitalism, you know? Well, yeah, and you're not. <laughs> right. I mean, you just then look at yourself and go, okay, what am I doing? You know, um, anyway, I could go on and on, but go ahead. Warren, did you want to say something? No, what I was just going to say, adding to the bleaching where I'm where I'm from back home in Jamaica that was very prevalent at one point like mm -hmm. it was almost a thing where like if you're not doing it you are not it was like a, a literal in thing like they would buy the products and they would apply it to their skin and after a time they'll see they almost look white in a sense and they would wear like hats and hoodies and socks and long pants to cover their skin from the sun because they know they're damaging their skin and they can't be in the sun for too long. Well, I mean, first of all, I told my students, white skin is crappy. Like it's bad skin. Look at me. I have these, you know, these age spots. <laughs> if you have dark skin, you don't, have, you, you know, you don't get age spots. They also are resilient against the sun, right? I've had a little little node or something that, that was cancerous, right? We get skin cancer, like we're, we have rotten skin. <laughs> but the other thing is that there are these advertisements and people tell these girls, your skin is too dark. You're not gonna be able to marry a guy that's wealthy or plans to be wealthy. So they have these ads where this little baby is born and this dad says, oh my goodness, her skin is dark. She's not going to be able to marry somebody that'll make money. And that's an ad for that product. Wow. Oh, isn't that awful? That's so horrible for child's images. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's bad to be, you know, you get a girl and they didn't want a girl, right? Mm -hmm. But a dark skinned girl, like, oh my God, she's... Oh, you guys. Anyway, I thought we had overcome that. I'm sorry, but like when I was growing up, there was this whole uh, about how there wasn't enough blacks on TV. We would have like certain stations, but it was yeah. only we knew about those stations, no one else. But now there's much more on TV and everything. And I thought we were coming to this point where it's okay to be yourself, you know? Um, but a thing that I wanted to ask about the um where you said that we might be brainwashed and we don't know it that's something that I have always thought about when looking at other uh, countries because like I think it's Asia or wherever they're like supposedly completely brainwashed and the government watches all of their um internet and everything um I feel like what if we're like that too and we just don't know it well wait a sec it's not the government, it's capitalism that's brainwashed. Not the government, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, you guys, you really have to make a distinction <laughs> because mm -hmm. there are politicians who are completely bought out by capitalists and they are capitalist puppets. And then there are the ones that are trying to fight against that. And mm -hmm. I find my students just completely, they hate the government. And it's just like, no, some... No. Some politicians are fighting against it. I like one of the books I'm reading is by a US Senator and her big thing is anti-competition to break down those big companies and promote competition, right? So she's very worried about this influence of rich corporations and how they buy out politicians and tell the politicians what laws to make or not make. So we will go in that into this section um, the section later on. I mean, we will always talk about the relation between personal, social, mm -hmm. and political, right? So um, uh, anyway, <laughs> I mean, it's fun and it sounds like we're going to have a great conversation and we can go off topic, except that because to me, nothing is off topic. Does that make sense? Everything is connected to everything. It's just that I probably have my job needs to keep you kind of focused a little bit so that the lesson for today is connected in a certain way, right? Um, 
But let's go back to the syllabus and just see if you have any questions about the, the uh, you know, process and all that stuff. Um, all right, so I'll stop for questions. And Warren, are you there? I think he disappeared. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. I'm oh. Right here. Oh, okay. Because somehow when it changed, I don't see both of you on my left hand side, which is odd. All right. I'm going to scroll through and just tell me if you have any questions. Um, again, I have office hours in the evening, but if you want to meet some other time, uh, I'm usually on my machine in the afternoons. And I want to make sure that because the provost uh, went out of her way to let me teach online. And I want to make sure that the students know that, that I will be accessible. I will read the stuff uh, quickly. And in other words, it won't cost, hopefully it won't cost anything in the quality of the education. Um, but anyway, um, so please, Whenever you want an office hour, I will be available. So we went over this about um, reading your papers, your oral presentation, uh, learning how to connect things and be a creative thinker, the union of reasoning in some sense of reason and faith in some sense of the good, your idea of a good life or a flourishing life. And then, you know, intellectual honesty. And that's, that's important, right? There's a lot of people who think they know what they don't know, and who also bring their ignorance into the political arena, and allow their ignorance to guide their voting behavior, which I think is, our founding fathers were completely against that. And so intellectual honesty is important. Commitment to truth. I don't want, I mean, we look at a lot of different opinions, but I, I, I think you'll figure out after a while that you don't want to think, oh, it's all relative. Anybody can think what they want. And we actually go over that argument um, in one of the classes. Being fair to opposing points of view, that's really important in our polarized era, being patient with complexity and ambiguity. Again, these are character traits and intellectual skills that are the only way to um, deal with the polarization that's um, chipping away at our democracy, I think. And tolerance of reasoned dissent, right? People can have good reasons and you can agree to disagree. That's fine. Um, it's when, <laughs> when students start writing papers saying, I know you're going to go to hell, Dr. Beck. <laughs> and that's okay, you know, because it takes some courage for them to say that. But um, in general, there are, there are people being sent onto, onto college campuses for the very purpose of saying things that are irrational and trying to undermine uh, the free and open atmosphere of college campuses. So um, it is very difficult to figure out how to deal with unreasoned dissent, with dissent that's designed to polarize. And I'm glad I don't have to make those decisions. Uh, what I have to do is try to convince you that that's harmful and that you would not do that because of how harmful it is. Um, the content, the strategy, the attendance, the, okay, the way the posts work. Did you have any questions? Before class, read it, write three reactions or questions. Um, at the beginning, I'll ask each of you, but I'm glad you already brought up some of that's fine. Um, then I'll kind of focus on why I assigned it, how it connects with what we've done. But the idea is that you don't have to have, that doesn't have to be your reaction. Your reaction is your reaction. Um, but I do think I owe it to you 
to show you that I that there is a system behind this and I didn't just throw a bunch of stuff together, right? Um, let's see, and then you do your takeaway, okay? Then I'll describe the readings for the next class and why I signed it. So the post for each class day has those parts. And then every week you post um, for all the classes that week. And so after today, you'll have the post will be due and I'll make it due this week, uh, tomorrow at five o'clock. Usually it's Friday at noon because we are going to meet on Monday and Wednesday. You have a minimum of 200 words for each day and then it goes up the first week, then 250, then three, then 350, then four. And then it, um, at, when we get to 400, that's the max, right? Um, and the, the maximum minimum, you can always write more. And I encourage you to write more. If you're writing because you, can, you wanna write down the way everything's connected and you want to keep comparing and contrasting and because it's a mental exercise, you know, you're cultivating your mind there's never any minimum, right? You can always write, um, tr but don't BS, you know, I don't wanna read BS, right? But as, if you are working something out in your mind, I want you to do that. Um, all right, a total of 10 posts, okay. Then there's a tardy thing, but again, I know that, that some of you have a class at 11 and that's fine. Um, then there's a research paper. Um, the thing about this is, I think I'm gonna allow you to choose either doing a research paper or doing two shorter papers that just stay stick to the course material. Um, and, um, That'll be up to you. You can decide what you wanna do. Then there's a final paper, um, late papers. If you think you might consider majoring or minoring in RPH, keep track of what you're writing, um, what you're doing on a file. There's the course, the honor policy. Did you have any questions on that? Does that seem, okay, good. Great. So let's go to the reading then. That's great. I'd rather do the reading too. But again, if you do have questions, um, just contact me, no problem. So briefly, this one, I think, I think this is amazing. The student from Bangladesh obviously sent this to me and a British person. This is what colonialism is. And um, if you can put it in a nutshell, this would be it. He sees completely impressed with the culture of India. I haven't seen one person who's a beggar, a thief, and such wealth, such high moral values, like a high quality of life, people of such caliber. All right, and then what does he say? I don't think we'll ever be able to conquer them unless we break the backbone, which is her spiritual and cultural heritage. So that's why I'm saying philosophy matters. Philosophy is the spiritual and cultural heritage. And I know that America is known for being anti-intellectual and, and that means being anti-cultural and it really means being anti-spiritual in a broader sense, even though we all supposedly go to church. Um, therefore, I propose we replace her old educational system and her culture. For if Indians think that everything that is foreign and English is good and greater than their own, they'll lose their self-esteem their native culture, and they will become what we want them to be, a truly dominated nation. Oh my God, it's so awful. And that thing about skin bleaching is exactly that. Do you understand that? 
They're, they've been made to feel ashamed of the color of their skin and they're obsessed with it. I mean, that means that this plan has been in place for centuries and it worked and it's horrible. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so I wanted to take this one. This is a list of what I call the classical virtues. And um, I apply it to Socrates and Jesus, but let's just go over those virtues. Self-control in eating, drinking, and sex, right? In the virtues, you can, there's a middle ground and then there's extremes, right? So you can eat too much, you can eat too little. You can eat for the right reason, in the right way, at the right time. Um, and, and our food system in the US, and again, we're exporting this, we have a food system that really poisons your body to tell you the truth. And there's books about this. I read a book called The Hacking of the American Mind, and it is about how sugar is an addiction. Um, and again, I, I can, I'm going to write an outline and like a 40 page cheat sheet, but it is awful and white flour and white rice, all these things, your body is getting this signal. It's getting a sugar high and then you go down and then you have to have another sugar high and uh, corn, corn syrup. It's leading to type two diabetes, heart disease, and then all the doctors who specialize in that make more money. And then the pharmaceutical companies and all these diabetes, you know, it's just awful that that greed has completely corrupted our food system. Um, then drinking um, sex, but intuitively you understand too much, too little, the mean. I think that's common sense. Then courage is how reacting well in the face of situations involving fear. So we can be afraid of um, sickness, aging, uh, war situations, but those aren't, in our society, we're more afraid of the economic war People are afraid they aren't going to make it into the middle class, right? They'll lose the economic war. Um, fear of social ostracism. How many people don't speak up or don't do the right thing because they don't want to lose their friends? They don't want someone to go on social media and trash them, right? And they don't want to um, lose their job. So social media has made this, I think, a lot worse. Is that true, you guys? Because I don't go on social media, so I don't know. But does it make you like afraid to say anything because you're you're gonna get pulverized? What about you, Ivy? I feel like at one point it was this big thing about cyberbullying and everything yeah. but now they're kind of trying to normalize talking about your issues so like um, it, which it's kind of an issue because they're oversharing and that's becoming a problem because it's like what do you put on the internet versus what you should keep to yourself but um, I feel like things like abuse or stuff that people really need to talk about and they don't um, seek help, but there are maybe other people that have experienced and may be able to help them. I feel like as far as that, it's a good idea. And it's people don't get shamed as much as they probably would have before. Is there a way to find out uh, a group, a friend group that does you know that's responsible and then just join that and just ignore everything else what do you mean like well okay say you want to talk about body shaming or abuse you want to talk about abuse you don't just throw it out there do you yeah they have a uh, specific uh facebook groups or um things like that where you can go and it's just about that certain topic you know and 
it's a complete open environment. <clears throat> but is it, is it also self-correcting so you don't have some guy coming in there and yeah they have uh moderators and people who um kick spam or whatever out if necessary okay um what about you warren do you as social media played to your to fears so that you are afraid of of what you say um personally how i am and to go off what Ivy was saying, you just have to know what to share. And me personally, I don't really share much of um, much of social media. I am on there. I see what's going on. I post now and again, but my personal life is not social. Oh, that makes that a lot makes of sense. sense. Uh, yeah. But then you have, as she was saying, then you have a lot of people there is just not a gauge of what they post. And then if someone maybe tries to um, say something to them, they run and say, oh, I can say what I want. It's my profile and this and that. Yes, that is, but not everyone has the moral compass or what I would say, the common sense not to post certain things. Yeah, okay. Well, again, that. Social social media is is a terror right now. To be very honest, it's good and it's bad. It really is. It is a terror though. Like it's a bittersweet yeah. encounter. Yeah, the QAnon. I don't think you know a lot of things. Social media really aggravates. Um, I'm hoping your generation will will. It's had it long enough so that you become savvy about it, right? There were those decade or so in there when it was so new and it was, you know, smells and bells and it looked so great. Um, but I think hopefully your generation is more aware of how dangerous it can be. Um, anyway, I mean, they, yeah. They, they are, some people are, because there was a trend at one point where like, if you make fun of someone, um, you're funny and all that type of stuff. But later on, as the end of last year, or I would say just as COVID hit and stuff and we went on the lockdown, people started to make like mental health a thing. Like to say, oh, we got to post this, we got to encourage mental health, we got to make sure people are okay. But then you're going to still have those who, people who just don't care. But like, it's all going through phases. So at one point it's this thing and then the next point is this thing and then the next point is this thing but i think the most prominent thing now is mental health like they're trying to promote mental health in regular people and athletes and people are feeling more confident to come forward and say how they are feeling and what they are feeling there is a lot of therapy online too these days right yeah if yes if you can afford it do people does insurance pay for that do people have access I, I yeah know. okay Probably. anyway um again to me those four years in college are your chance to step back and sort of resolve some things about how you want to use it and how you don't want right that's why i liked college you get away from everything. You can't live just by custom and habit. You're not being told what to do all the time. But now you have agency and you have to make your decisions. And you might make some mistakes and then you have some time to self-correct. But that's why I like teaching college students. And I just want them to just examine everything, re-examine everything and decide how they want to live. Um, generosity is important. And I think a lot of our disagreements about tax, the tax issues are, should education be just a matter of private, you know, philanthropy, rich folk pay for our schools, or do we want public education paid for by taxpayers so that we can have an educated populace, right? Um, what about healthcare? Do you want the rich get what they want and everybody else gets whatever they can pay for? Or do you want 
a certain level of taxation and um, government funded healthcare? Do you want it to be designer healthcare? Do you want it to just be basic healthcare, right? All of that stuff has to do with the issue of generosity. So there's private generosity, there's public um, systems in place. Anyway, so that goes on and on. Anger, not overreacting, underreacting. Honor, um, honor means you go above and beyond to create a high quality of life. Ambition, finding your talents, uh, getting the pieces of paper you need so the society will allow you to exercise them, doing exercising them in a way that promotes other people. Um, let's see, uh, call out corruption. You have friends who help you out. Um, sociability, getting along with people. This is where polarization has been terrible. It just seems like people will polarize based on any sort of petty thing, but that is going to destroy democracy or stability. It just destroys stability. Um, let's see, I'm going to give you another list. This isn't the best list. I'm sorry. Um, know thyself, the political virtue. So let's go back. I think that letter um, from the student was a, a good example of it. So, so tell me, um, let's see, Warren, how much of this did you read? Did you read this one? I, I, honestly, I did not read it into detail. I read the, the one about- um, Read it. Zuckerberg and the other, and the one about, um, what's it called? About Ready? the letter that we just did. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's okay, it. the virtues. Um, so Ivy, yeah. did, you did you read this one? You no, know, the uh, pages were a little confusing for me. I didn't uh, know like which one was one first or what are the, the orders were a little confusing for me, but I read the, um, unjust suffering the yeah okay 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 so i'm i'm gonna reassign this to you um just because okay here's a girl from bangladesh actually you don't have to read the first one it's all right starting with page three and then just because um and those are the questions and i i would like for in your post for you to address some of those questions. And I did post something on the stream just now about that. How has COVID affected your character, right? And how do you want it to affect? Okay, so the page issues, like here's, I think the second page, right? So you have to go that, this letter is good because she applies all this stuff to her life. So I would like you to read that. She's the girl from Syria. And then this one is a girl from, um, let's see, Nepal. And for her, it strengthened her family relationships. So I would like you to read that one. And um, this, oh, yeah, okay. Oh yeah, that really is confusing, I'm sorry. This is page one, this is page two. And this is page three, so I'm sorry about that. Um, and then this one is the pandemic didn't affect mental health. Well, first of all, I have a couple issues with this article. Um, how do you know? Because the pandemic isn't even nearly over yet, for one thing. Like, to me, sometimes psychological research is based on such a minimum amount of uh, people that they're researching. It's so impulsive and immediate, right? I mean, come on guys. <laughs> but what they're saying here is that people's personalities after there was immediate sort of problems and then it leveled out. I just like, how on earth do you know? So 
to me, too much of this stuff, that's why I'm in humanities, is that you have to read history to find out what the effect of the COVID was, right? We're gonna have to look back and think about it. And I do think rather than taking studies where you just ask people questions and they give you whatever answer happens to be on their mind, you can step back a little bit and think of your own experience and think of which aspects of it do you think are more common or less common, are going to be more traumatic over time or less. Just reflect a little bit on your own um, because when people take these surveys, the psychologist asks you, what do you think right now? You know, and everybody changes their mind all the time. <laughs> I, I just, it drives me nuts. Um, because again, obviously I'm a philosopher. Um, but for, if, for example, I had a student who was doing research on how the millennials vote. Well, you know, they haven't gotten married. They don't have kids. They don't have a mortgage. I mean, how do you deal with voting over time anyway? And I know you have to go, right? Do, and then there's Zuckerberg there. And that's the idea that uh, the, the same set of categories that inspired the girl from Syria is the categories that justifies rape, right? It's like, wait a sec, how did that happen? So just learning how a certain theories can get applied in ways that are just radically different. Um, so who has a one o'clock class? Do you have a one o'clock class, Warren? I have work. Okay, have what about you, Ivy? Yes. No, okay, where do you work, Warren? On campus. On so campus. you have to step out and go to work? In a, in a minute, not immediately, but in a second. Okay. So again, yeah. um, so Warren is going to come late, leave early. That's all right. I'll try to factor that in. Make time, sure you get that. What time do we, we end? One? Because you said it left. Yeah, officially it's one. But again, I'm here. Okay. If people want to extend the conversation, um, okay. you can. And I will leave the recording on. So if you miss something. Uh, but, you know, conversations like these, one of the worst things about America is nobody has time, right? Everybody just has to hurry, hurry, hurry. And that is yeah. not good for your mind. It is not good for your mind. Um, all the way. All the way through human history until recently, Sunday was a day of rest. There was a reason for that. Sunday was a day to reflect. And now, you know, Sundays are like any other day, but we're just playing with fire. We're playing with our psyche by not giving it a chance to reflect. So anyway, that's my sermon. <laughs> as, you were, as you were talking about... Um... The girl that wrote the thing about the rape, um, the, the things that justify the rape and stuff. I, um, it was yesterday, actually, I saw an Instagram post that there was, um, you know, the Title IX that the school, Title IX that the school always talked. There was a thing that we, um, there was a guy who was trying to get a, a, a law passed that schools like should get like a one free rape case and then they take severe action. Like let it happen once first and then we could be like, okay, they don't want it to be reprimanded immediately if it happens. They're like, okay, like you get a slap on the wrist the first time and then next time it's like, okay, you're in trouble, which to me really makes no sense. And then again, here we have, men trying to make decisions for everyone. Right. Well, not only that, well, first of all, does that mean a, a woman has a mind where the first rape doesn't traumatize her, right? It's only the yeah. second one where she gets traumatized. I mean, come she on. She could die. <laughs> she could die. But I mean, it's one. the permanent trauma is guaranteed. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and 
Oh, God. But here's another thing. Betsy DeVos, Mr. Trump put her in charge of the Department of Education. And she, one of the things she did was to make it more difficult to accuse. It's a woman. She's a billionaire. She went to all private Christian schools. Trump put her in charge of our public education system. Okay. <laughs> and she immediately used that post to help private schools and try to get vouchers and to undermine the public system. When the CARES Act came in to give money to schools during COVID, she found a way to get it to private schools and she got sued by the state of Michigan. But you guys need to know this, right? Wow. Betsy DeVos is working to make it harder for women on she doesn't go interview people in human resources. She just declares it because she's a billionaire's daughter. I mean, how many guys are going to date a billionaire's daughter from a Christian school and rape her? Right? Right? I mean, you're the rich rich guy's daughter. You don't touch her. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's right? life in prison. <laughs> but I mean, okay. Then somebody else, the Democrat, had a guy who, who'd been poor, pulled himself up by the bootstraps. He's in charge, black guy. Who do you want, right? It's both the government. Well, wait a sec. That's a different government. Does that make sense, Ivy? Mm -hmm. Don't say, the government just drives me nuts. <laughs> I wish I could make a better distinction, but every time I like try to get into the news and everything and in politics it's just there's a I lot know. of contradictions I, know. I understand and I, I don't know and then there's fake like I don't want to say fake I news know. but there's a lot of false I news know. that's why I started that reading group and I'll put you on the google classroom you don't ever have to go in there um but I'll I'll make a list of the books and the issues um because I I vote on the basis of the cabinet who does this, is this president going to appoint to the cabinet? Because they're the ones that enforce the laws. And so, for example, Department of Labor, my daughter worked for them. It's minimum wage, it's occupational safety and hazards, it's whistleblower, right? And most Americans want some minimum wage and they want protection from getting poisoned or hurt on the job. And, you know, they want that they could report their company breaking the law and not get fired, right? People want that. But guess who Trump put in charge of it? The head of Carl's Jr. who actually had been sued by the Department of Labor for his practices more than once. And so Trump puts him in charge. Are those laws gonna get enforced? No, and then, and then some will say, the government didn't enforce the law, no. It's Mr. Carl's Jr. that didn't, you know, and then a Democrat will put someone in who actually wants those laws to get enforced. Okay, so it's the, I mean, in other words, I don't blame you for not knowing it, but I do think it's really important that you don't know that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's, and it, yeah. So that's all I'm asking is, I'm, I'm just have my reading group. This is what I think is important for college students to know. And I have a bias, middle class. And um, that's what I think politicians, that's what I hire them to do. I don't hire them to tell me how Christian they are. And I don't hire them to tell me if I can be gay or not, right? It's not going to change anybody anyway. Why do they talk about stuff they have no power? I don't know. That's so crazy to me because it's like we have so many other issues to address but this is one that's like so big and it's like but you it's not gonna affect that's us done all. on purpose that's done on purpose like, it's okay. your personal yeah. problem and then it's like if everyone else doesn't accept you it doesn't really matter because they're not living your life you know but if you sit and debate that then you don't notice that the rich are walking away with the country it's hmm? a plan. It's a plan. Sorry, I didn't hear that last part oh, you said. If people are sitting there and obsessing about abortion, women are going to get them anyway. Gay, people are going to be gay or straight anyway. But if you obsess about that, 
you don't notice that rich corporations are taking over everything. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That the middle class is shrinking and some politicians want to do something about it and others want to cover it up because that's who pays for their campaigns. So anyway, I it's just sad that it's really hard to see the big picture and, and that's why I thought, okay, that's what I read my books about. I read lots of books about it. And so um, anyway, I'll let you go. It's time to go um, unless you want to stay, but I'm getting on a soapbox now, so it's not good. <laughs> I think it's going to be a fun class. I hope you think so. I hope you look forward to it, whatever. So I did put on the stream you know, I would like you to talk about COVID and how it's affected your character, if that's all right. I usually don't give someone the, something that specific, but I think it would be good for you to go through that. And if you just read the way those couple of girls wrote that, but you don't have to have that due in a big hurry because it, it'll take some time. Um, if you could hand it in maybe by the next class before Monday's class. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Oh, is that the end? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, Ivy, if you want to hang hang on, you can. You want to talk about anything else? Uh, not that I can 